everyone. In this video, we're going to be learning about dimension and rank, and we're picking up where we left off with subspaces. So just some reminders for you. A basis for a subspace is a linearly independent set that spans H. So the basis for the subspace H is a linearly independent set in H that also spans H. Then remember that a span of vectors is just a set of all linear combinations of those vectors. And then relating that to a subspace, the span of the vectors is a subspace spanned by those vectors. And then the standard basis, and this could be for any R, so it could be like R3, R4, Rn, um, is just your, ba uh, your vectors from your, think of it like an identity matrix. I'm just saying for R2, the standard basis is the set containing E1 and E2. So if you visualize a 2 by 2 matrix, this E1 would be column 1, where the, it would be entry 1, 0, and then E2 would be entry 0, 1. And so that what I want you to know or notice is that R2 is equal to the span of those two vectors. Basically what this is saying is you can generate all of two-dimensional space as linear combinations of those two vectors. All right, so now the new part, they're going to first define coordinate systems, and then what we're going to lead into is eventually um, dimensions and then rank. So our definition here, we're going to define coordinates of x relative to a basis, b. So suppose that the set b contains the vectors b1 and so on, and it's a basis for some subspace h. Then for each vector x in h, the coordinates of x, so like how you would locate x, relative to that basis are the weights, c1 and so on, such that x equals a linear combination of the vectors in the basis with those weights on them. So it might sound complicated, but try to, we'll see a visual in a little while, um, but just think of it like this. So it's saying, how can I locate x, if you want to visualize it, in space, um, but using the vectors that form this basis? For the subspace. And then the vector x a sub b, or we call it the coordinate vector of x relative to b, we also call it b coordinate vector of x, is just the vector containing those weights, where the ele elements of the vector are those weights. So here's an example. So here we have three vectors, uh, v1, v2, or sorry, <laughs> and x, yeah. And then b is the set containing v1 and v2. All right, first notice that vectors v1 and v2 are linearly independent, and we could tell just by looking because they're not multiples of each other, scalar multiples. And so by definition of a basis, then b is actually a basis for h, we're calling h the span of those vectors. So this is just using the definition of basis, okay? Since they're, it's a linearly independent set, the set containing b, v1 and v2, um, and it, when you span them, when you generate a space with them, that's the definition of a basis. Okay, so then we want to know, is x in h? And if it is, find the coordinate vector of x relative to that basis. All right, so let's begin our solution. First, we need to figure out, is x even in h at all? So x is in h if it's a linear combination of the vectors that span or generate h. So visually or mathematically, you could just say x equals a linear combination of the two vectors in this basis, b. Okay, so what that is the same as is does this um, equation here have an answer? Okay, is this consistent? So we can notice we just replace v1 with what it equals, v2. Oh, well, this should, these equal signs are not supposed to be there. Okay, forget that equal sign. This should be multiply. And then v2 and then equals x. Okay, so we can write it as an augmented matrix and then we'll reduce it. And so notice it is consistent. There's an answer. This says that c1 equals 2 and c2 equals 3. And so our coordinate vector of x is just the vector with the elements 2, 3. So yes, x was in h and we found the coordinate vector of x relative to the basis. All right, so here's a visual for you. The basis determines a coordinate system on H, which can be visualized here. So basically, what you're doing is you're saying, how can I locate X using the vectors 
in the basis, in the set. How can I locate x using v1 and v2? And so we set up this coordinate system. In this case, it's a plane, okay, the plane h. And notice here's x. We figure out the weights was um, 2 for c1 and 3 for c2. And so using the vector, say this is vector v1 and the vector v2, we can locate x in space um, on this grid. So 2v1 plus 3v2 gets us right here to x. So that's what we're doing here with this coordinate system. All right, now we're ready to talk about the dimension of a subspace. So the definition is that the dimension of a non-zero subspace h, denoted dim of h, is just the number of vectors in any basis for h. And so some facts for us. The dimension of the zero subspace is defined to be zero. The space Rn has n dimensions. And this is because every basis for Rn has n vectors in it. And then the dimension of null of A, so remember the null space of A, is the number of free variables in the equation x A times x equals zero. So just remember that we define the null space of A to be the set of solutions to this equation, this homogeneous equation. Now let's define rank. So the rank of a matrix A, denoted rank A, is just the dimension of the column space of A. And reminder that the column space is just the set of linear combinations of the columns of A. And so another way to write that is that the column space of A is the span of the columns of A. And then recall, we've talked about this previously, that the pivot columns of a matrix form a basis for the column space. And so now that just means that our rank of our matrix A is equal to the number of pivot columns of A. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. We want to determine the rank of this matrix A. So we'll uh, reduce this one just down to echelon form. And the reason why is because we want to identify the pivot columns. So notice there's three pivot columns. And so the matrix has three pivot columns. So the rank of A is just three. All right, so just a few more things to mention. We have the rank theorem, which says if a matrix A has n columns, then the rank of A plus the dimensions of the null space of A total n when you add them up. And the reason for this is because remember rank of A is just the number of pivot columns, and then the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of free variables. So if you add up pivot columns plus free variables, that's n. And then the basis theorem says that if we let H be a p dimensional subspace of Rn, then the following two things are true. Any linearly independent set of exactly p elements is in H is automatically a basis for H. And then also, any set of p elements of H that spans H is automatically a basis for H. So just some nice theorems that we can use when we need them. And then the last thing here is to go back to the invertible matrix theorem, which we talked about invertible matrices in the past. We looked at this theorem previously, um, and now we're going to add to it. So this theorem is already pretty long. We have quite a few components of it, and we're going to add a few more to it. So our invertible th uh, matrix theorem continued. We're adding the following. And so we can now say that the columns of A form a basis of Rn, that the column space of A equals Rn, that dimension of the column space of A equals n, rank of A equals n, the dimension of the null space is zero, and then the dimension of the null space of A, uh, or sorry, the null space of A is a zero set, and then the dimension of the null space of A is zero. This is all true for invertible matrix. So remember, if your matrix is invertible, meaning it has an inverse, then everything in this theorem is true, or if your matrix if anything in this theorem is false, then all of it's false and your matrix is not invertible. All right, so that's it for this one. Take care.